What's going on guys and welcome to another Doctor Who classic review. Today I'm going to be reviewing the fourth Doctor Tom Baker story, Planet of Evil. Now before I get started with this one, I do want to first of all just apologise. I've been a bit bad with uploading videos again recently. I was going to get start getting back into it, but this last week I've actually been fairly sick. You can probably still hear it in my voice now. I'm not great, but I am getting over it now and my voice isn't anywhere near as bad as it was. I could barely talk the other day. Um, so I thought... I, wa I watched this episode today and I thought my girlfriend's just gone out of the house so I thought this is the prime opportunity to record this and I can do it now without too much difficulty. I might just sound a little bit nasally. But um, yeah, sorry for that. We're going to get back into things. So um, yeah, reviewing Planet of Evil today. Never seen this episode. It's one from season 13, Tom Baker's second season, and yeah, I've never seen this before. It's one that doesn't get talked about a whole lot. I mean, season 13 is a season, it's one of the, you know, better regarded seasons um, in Tom Baker's run, in the whole classic run. Um, but Planet of Evil is one that doesn't get talked about as much. Um, so yeah, I was interested to see what I would think of it. Anyway, this is Planet of Evil by Louis Marx. The Doctor and Sarah answer an intergalactic distress call that takes them to a far-flung planet at the edge of the known universe, Zeta Minor. Arriving at the same time as a rescue team, they search for survivors of an earlier expedition, but will anyone be allowed to leave the planet alive? So a fairly brief synopsis of the back of the DVD there, but you know, a relatively interesting one. We've got a planet, um, they get the the Doctor gets a distress call from the planet, and he's going down there to, to see what's going on. So, um, yeah, a decent little premise, I suppose. Anyway, let's get started with the cast. So, Tom Baker as the fourth Doctor. Yeah, I mean, he is good in this one. There's no denying that. I don't think there's any real standout moments or a standout performance from him in this one. He's perfectly fine, perfectly fine with what he's got, but there's not a whole lot of, you know, funny moments. There's a few little serious moments, um, you know, where the Doctor's getting really annoyed by the fact that he's getting accused all the time of being the one that's killing all the rescuers' men. Um, yeah, other than that, yeah, the, the comedy part of it is not really there so much in this. There might be a couple of little bits at the start of the episode, kind of before the Doctor and Sarah know what's going on on this planet. Um, but other than that, after that point, there isn't really any comedy at all here. It's a very serious episode. Um... But um, yeah, Tom Baker's performance is delightful as always. And then you've got Elizabeth Sladen as Sarah Jane Smith, which once again, she's pretty good in this one. To be fair, Sarah doesn't really have a lot to do in this episode. Sarah's one of those companions where in a lot of the stories, she does have a fairly decent role and does quite a bit. But um, this is one of those ones where she doesn't really do anything. She's just kind of there. Um, so it's quite disappointing on that factor for me. Um, but you know... Of course, Elizabeth Sladen puts in a banging performance with what she's got. So now we go on to the good and the bad, starting with the good. The Doctor and Sarah respond to a distress signal. So yep, distress signal comes in on the TARDIS, and we see before that it's one of the uh, expeditioners on the um, on the planet of Zeta... Zeta Mortha? What is it called again? Oh god, I've forgotten what it's called. Zeta Minor, that's the one, um, who sends the distress signal and then instantly dies after he sends the signal. Um, the Doctor picks that up and goes to the planet, but he doesn't know where he's actually landed at that point. Um, and that also sends the rescue party to go there as well. Um, so yeah, it's, I, I do like it when it's not just the Doctor landing on a random planet and it just so happens that, you know, something happens on this planet that he's got to sort out i mean yes it's probably and we've kind of learned this from like the doctor's wife in the 11th doctor's era the the tardis is kind of you know he it knows where the where the doctor is needed and kind of takes him there but i like it when it's you know the doctor's actually responding to a distress call and doing it on his own i, I just like that i think that's a pretty cool way to kind of introduce the characters to the story the rescuers believe the Doctor and Sarah are killing the people. So, yeah, basically all these people are randomly dying, and to be fair, the Doctor and Sarah get, you know, it's it's a little bit unfortunate for them because there's a couple of times where a couple of people die, and then they find the Doctor and Sarah, and they're like, you must have done this, and then there's that one um, guy who dies with the Doctor and Sarah there, and when the other people come to investigate, they're literally standing over his dead body. So, um, yeah, I mean... It's it's a bit bad on their part. They were just kind of in the wrong place at the wrong time, um, but they're constantly getting um, constantly getting accused of killing these people. When in fact, as we all know, that is not the case. 
um, the planet won't let them take any minerals. So basically the whole premise of this is that the expeditioners who were the first group to go on this planet, of which there's only one left um, by the time the Doctor and all that gets onto the planet, um, they've come there to find this new kind of energy source. Um, and they're going to take this energy source, these minerals, which turns out to be like an antimatter. Um, they're going to take it onto their ship, fly back to... I don't know if these guys are from Earth. I, I'm not sure if they actually went over that or not, but wherever they come from in a different, um, you know, dimension, I suppose, um, in a different universe, um, I think it's the right way to put it. Um, and they're going to use this stuff to, because their sun is, you know, the sun is destroying itself or whatever. They're losing the power from the sun, so they need power from something else to survive. Um, but the thing is, they can't actually take this stuff because this antimatter it cannot go between universes or between dimensions or however they um, however they word it. It just physically can't happen. So they try and take this stuff and yeah, the universe, the planet is just not gonna let it happen. And that's pretty much the whole premise of the story. They get all these minerals onto the ship and the planet's just not gonna let it happen because you cannot take these minerals off this planet and out of this universe. The professor mutating because of the antimatter. So basically, the antimatter kind of screws with the with the uh, the professor who is the the last surviving expeditioner um, who um, is trying to get these minerals on board. And um, yeah, he basically gets the antimatter starts mutating him and turns him into this crazy creature, and eventually turns him into a bunch of these antimatter monsters. Um, really strange how it all works and it's not really explained that well how these things work but basically turns into a bunch of these weird antimatter creatures and he goes and turns into an animal himself pretty much and starts killing people so um yeah pretty crazy stuff there like i was just saying about the antimatter creatures they all start multiplying so you go from just having the professor to having like an antimatter creature version of him and then there's like 20 of them or however many they're absolutely everywhere they're multiplying um surrounding the ship they're in the ship they are not letting this ship um take off so um yeah pretty cool and i do actually quite like the design of the antimatter creatures yes it's basically just a bunch of scribbles in the vague well when they take over um when they take the form of the professor they look like the professor in his crazy animal form um before that it's just like this weird squiggly creature thing that we see kind of in that pit um when the doctor falls into the pit as well that's a crazy moment that i didn't actually write down but that in itself is a crazy moment don't 100 percent know what was going on there but it was pretty crazy um but yeah although it's a fairly subtle and let's be honest now quite dated effect i do quite like these creatures i like the fact that they're not it's like a cso effect it's not somebody in a costume so just because of that it actually does look better and because it is very minimalistic um, in nature, it works okay as CSO. I think when they, they go too bold in these classic episodes with the CSO, that's when it starts to look really fake and really not very good, but I think it works really well here. And the final thing I've got here is that the jungle setting, it looks really good. The jungle on this episode is so good. That's one of the things I heard about this episode, that the set design was amazing. I mean, the ship and all that sort of stuff is fairly basic, boring, spaceship sort of thing, nothing crazy going on there. But the kind of jungle of the planet itself, it looks awesome. It's really well done. Um, there's some great shots in there as well. I think they used, um, they decided to use film for a few parts as well, which just makes it look so much better. Altogether, yeah, that whole jungle setting with the coloring, just with the look and how, how it is, it's just, it's a really good set, especially for the time. So onto the bad, not a whole lot to talk about here. I have got that it gets a bit repetitive with the constant accusing of the Doctor and Sarah. Um, you know, you've got that that the uh, the in charge, the kind of commander, um, the young guy who's constantly accusing the Doctor and Sarah of being the ones to kill everyone. And you know, most of the other people, especially the older guy, he in the end figures out no, it's not them. They're helping us. It's definitely not them. But the young guy doesn't ever believe it he's always putting the blame on them and in the end gets himself killed um and that does annoy me a little bit just because one it's just really annoying seeing someone constantly blaming them all the time when there's so much evidence to the fact that they are not they are trying to help you out and it's also quite an overused um an overused plot in doctor who and probably in sci-fi in general you've got you know the young um 
commander and the older but wiser kind of second in command and he's the wiser one and the younger one just doesn't really know what he's doing and it's a bit of an overused plot point but um other than that yeah it's a little bit slow in places in the middle for sure but um yeah it's altogether not too much bad to say about it so for a rating out of 10 I'm going to give this one an 8 out of 10, um, although I don't really have a whole lot to say bad about it, um, and I do like the the general plemis, the general premise of the plot and what's going on, um, it does still kind of feel a bit slow in parts, um, and I like the antimatter plot, I think that's a really cool plot, um, it works really well, I just think there could have been a bit more to this episode, I don't really know how, but I just feel like there could have been a bit more. It didn't feel that kind of packed with information and stuff. It felt a little bit bland in places. So for that, I'm just going to give it an 8 out of 10. It's definitely a decent episode. Only four parts long, so a relatively easy watch for the classic series. Um, so yeah, an 8 out of 10 for Planet of Evil. Anyway, that's going to be it for this video, guys. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed, please go ahead, like, and subscribe. And I'll see you guys in the next video.